Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for Reformation Sunday, which falls on October 29, 2023. If you're looking for the podcast for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, that is also available. If you're not of the Reformation, if you're not Reformationally inclined, maybe I'll say. Anyway, Here we go. Reformation Sunday, October 29, 2023. The first reading is Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Our psalm is Psalm 46. Romans chapter 3, 19 through 28 is the second reading. And the gospel reading for Reformation Sunday always is from John chapter 8, 31 through 36. Do you have anything to say about John? Me? I was talking to Caroline. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking to I me. might have a couple things, but... but. I, I don't know why I thought you might. <laughs> well, it is... It's such a... I talk about this a lot when I teach John and preach on John. Uh, well, mostly teach John and, and teach preaching with regard to the fact that this is the only passage that is included in the lectionary and then again only on on chapter uh, uh only on reformation Sunday, chapter seven and eight of the gospel of john and so we're in a, a a very uh polemical section of this gospel between jesus and the and the religious leaders and uh which are are fundamentally around theological differences and so that's 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 what's going on here, but it's this wider, you know, a wider, uh, that wider context of where the, where the polemic and the discussions between Jesus and the, and the Jewish leaders really come to a forefront. Uh, and so, but this, this particular passage obviously resonates with a lot of a lot of Reformation themes, uh, particularly if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of Reformation theology and Reformation, uh, Reformation lenses are brought to that passage. But I'll just say a couple things with that, these first verses that the word continue, it's translated continue here in the NRSV, but the word here is actually abide. It's meno, and which is translated a number of different ways throughout the Gospel of John, stay, remain, uh, uh, continue, abide. But it's, of course, one of John's most favorite words. And I would just invite the preacher to consider what is Jesus asking here? What is Jesus' invitation if you abide in my word? So, and the, and he is the word. And so it's another way for Jesus to emphasize that this this relationship with, with Jesus is what brings about freedom or what brings about uh and yeah, which what brings about freedom and that so that abiding in abiding in Jesus. And then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. I think the other thing that we would want to consider with that is that this is not truth in the abstract. This is not like this abstract truth, but but the truth of God revealed in Jesus. And so Jesus will say later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, and so those two those two particular aspects of these verses, I think, are important to uh, put in the larger context of the Gospel of John and not abstract, you know, continue in my word and not abstract truth. So, I have those another, are my first comments. I have another direction I want to go in, but first, uh, piggybacking off of uh, this abstract idea of truth, I also want to uh, lay uh, out uh, John uh, seventeen three, um, where um, the disciples uh, overhear Jesus talking, praying, and Jesus says, "And this is life eternal, mm-hmm. that they may know you, meaning God, and the one whom you have sent, meaning Jesus." And in that, 
the choice of life or the knowing of truth is the opposite of the choice of death or the knowing of good and evil. And uh, so th there's, uh, th there's also that in the larger narrative of John, which makes this idea of truth not be abstract, but truly um, to know God and to know Jesus whom God has sent. All good stuff. I think if um, if I was handed this text this year, I would want to talk about freedom, <clears throat> that line of the truth will make you free, but also if the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. And this comparison between servitude and freedom, I think I would want to encourage people to see Christian freedom as less freedom in the political sense, which is how it often gets, you know, is there an authority over you or something? And to think about like the ways we talk about freedom um, forgive the sports metaphor, but it, it, basketball coaches and sports commentators will sometimes talk about systems in which players are allowed to be free mm -hmm. from a particular kind of strategic that, you know, certain players will hunt their shots or things like that. We talk about free writing, you know, and creative writing where people can just, you know, write and go. And so I, I think of the connections between freedom and creativity, mm -hmm. freedom and being allowed to explore who you really are to know what you're good at, to be willing to try and fail things you're not so good at. It's that kind of a freedom that comes from, I think, knowing yourself really well and knowing you're, you're um, trying to use the word free, you're, you're allowed to mess up mm -hmm. because what's going to happen when you succeed is going to be all the more worth it, whether it's a creative artistic endeavor, athletic endeavor, relational endeavor. What does it mean to really be free to be yourself uh, in a relationship. I, I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm, if that's totally foreign to John or not, mm -hmm. but we often talk about freedom and, and as if, you know, who's your, who's over you now, or what is the authority over you now? And I, I just want to expand our imagination a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That allows my second point, um, which uh, uh, takes the verse after that. Um, you said, Matt, that, um, um, we're free to know who we are. Um, I, I, I'm not going to get that exactly right, but um, uh, you said something along along that lines, and um, I'm going to use that as a segue. Um, I, I know what it was. You were talking something about uh, our political moment, and uh, so I'll use that as a segue. In that next verse, what we number is 33, the response uh, of uh, those that Jesus was speaking to is to say, hey, we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. Excuse me? Yeah. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like your entire story as the descendants of Abraham is that your God is the God who rescued you from slavery. Um, and the reason that uh, if I were preaching this, I, I would venture in this direction. It's just because we're in a moment right now where people don't know their history. Um, and it fits with the idea of what does it mean to truly be a disciple of God? What does it truly mean to be um, the peculiar countercultural community of faith that demonstrates the kingdom of God, that demonstrates the justice of God? And if we don't know our history, if if the church doesn't know who we are um, truly, uh, then we will, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, but uh, I think it fits with Reformation. I think I said this um, uh, not a few weeks ago. I think we said this uh, when we were doing the podcast for um, uh, uh, this Sunday, not Reformation, uh, that Reformation is about um, who our icon is, what is our brand, and uh, they wanted to claim to be the brand of Abraham, and yet they'd forgotten exactly what that is. I think another aspect of this passage that's, that is important to note is the, the fact that freedom, again, it's not, you know, like you were talking about, Matt, this is not freedom in the abstract, but, but it is contrasted with um, sin. And, uh, and it, and the fact that sin, you know, in the Gospel of John, sin is being apart from Jesus or being uh, being separated from God or not in a relationship with Jesus. And so, um, 
the to be to be free is to actually to be bound in relationship with <laughs> with with Jesus and with God and and so it's a um it, there is a claim on what freedom is looking like as well here uh, in terms of and how we how we connect some of those um those those particularities with the themes of reformation i think are uh, would be important so that we don't so that we don't get this, and I think would be helpful for a sermon on Reformation Sunday that you don't have to preach the entire Reformation. You don't have to preach like the whole thing, and you just just give people one lens into what the Reformation means, and use one aspect of any of these texts to say this is this is what it means to be a reforming church. This is what you know. This is what's at stake, uh, and don't yeah, don't try to. Don't ch try to redo the Reformation. How about that? Which Reformation are you talking about? <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I just I think on Reformation Sunday we should we should engage in petty denominational bickering. I think it's a good way to celebrate it's the Reformation. Way to celebrate. <laughs> well, well, here we are. Three that can go at each other. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>, no. <laughs> uh, can All right. We go to yeah. Jeremiah yeah. 31. Yeah, if we go to Jeremiah, um, how do I say this? One way to be reformed. <laughs> um, it's interesting for me that this is the, that uh, uh, the prophet Jeremiah is saying to the descendants of Abraham and Sarah who have received this new covenant, a conditional covenant under Moses, uh, which they broke. And the prophet is saying, but I will give you, I will put my law within them. This is a new covenant that I will make with the, with the house of Israel. This is the words going back to the gospel of John that Jesus is actually discussing with the woman at the well. Uh, the day will come when um, the old ways of worship will not be how you worship, um, whether you're worshiping on the mountain or in the temple in Jerusalem, but the way of worshiping will be in spirit and truth. And you talked about that a little bit earlier, Caroline. And what does that look like? Well, it, it looks like that they, that the least of them will be the greatest. And that is totally different than what it means to be the chosen, what it means to be um, the teacher, um, an, another text that we were looking at. Um, what does it mean to be uh, the one in charge, um, whether that's a Pharisee or a Sadducee or um, uh, to do our denominational spats, the right denomination? Um, whatever we think is the least might very well be the best example of the servant of God. That makes a prophetic word to be preached today uh, mm -hmm. on this Reformation Sunday. I think with Jeremiah, yeah, I like that a lot. I think with Jeremiah, uh, uh, just taking my own advice, one thing I would do with uh, with a Reformation Sunday on Jeremiah is is talk about how how is how is ref how is reforming like new covenanting mm -hmm. um that we have a you know we have a god of covenant we have a covenanting god and sometimes that covenant those those that connection that relationship those covenants need to be reevaluated <laughs> or they need to be re they need to be changed in some way or they need to be reminded of uh and uh because it's hard to stay in covenants uh it's hard to maintain a covenant and so uh i would maybe do something with that homiletically that you know that we have a god who wants to who is committed to us is always it wants to be in covenant with us and 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 how we lose sight of that, and sometimes that means the church has to has to do that kind of reforming work to remind itself of to whom it belongs and um, and and who it represents, and uh, so it so that covenant can 
be maintained. That's what I would do. All right, Psalm 46, guess what I would do with this? Sing it. I'm guessing after the mighty fortress. (laughs) I would just sing it. Sing, (laughs) sing, 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 sing. Or the other thing you could do, I, you know, is, I mean, you could get super creative and just have the whole service be built around this song. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, whether it's singing it or singing it and using it as a, as a litany preaching on it. I uh, just like build the entire service around this psalm. How is this psalm? Uh, how is how is what has this psalm meant in the in you know sort of a reception history? When has it meant different things to you uh, in different places of, of your life? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, I, you could just sing it or that was another idea I had just like built the, build the entire, the entire service around the Psalm and see what happens. could be fun. I like that. I'm not touching that. All right. Yeah. You win. Yes. Okay. You win the podcast. Yes. I win the podcast. I win the podcast. All right. <laughs> great. Need, we need to do Romans. Yep. Romans three. Which just side. I did. <laughs> oh, what do you want to do? <laughs> oh, there's just so much, right? You could spend a month, uh, you know, preaching every day on this. But yeah, <clears throat> first of all, commend someone Richard Askoff. Who who's Romans the- for, for 13 years. I know of someone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first, I would commend Richard Askoff's commentary. He's a fine Pauline scholar and a good writer, and brings up brings up some important aspects of what's going on here. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, I don't know where I would drop in. This year I would probably, you know, since since Richard in the commentary actually explains a little bit about the the debate about faithfulness of Christ versus, yeah. versus faith in Christ, yeah. I don't have to explain it in the podcast, but I would maybe just talk about, you know, what, I look at verse 26, right? The one who has faith in Jesus. And then just to start poking around at that a little bit, what does that actually mean? For some people, it means, do you really believe there was a person named Jesus who died and rose from the dead? In other words, it's all cognitive, right? Other people, it's like, do you really believe that stuff they teach in your church? You know, do you really believe in the miracles and things? Uh, but to just to start to push it and say, this is what if this is about trust? Mm-hmm. And what if trust is a better translation? And and what about Jesus is trustworthy? And how did Jesus himself display trust? I mean, I would just kind of start to take what looks like a very simple clause and start to make it really complicated, not for the sake of like making it complicated, but just to kind of start to poke around and ask, what is the what is faith that we use as this shorthand expression for a very dynamic way of thinking about how one lives one's life and the decisions that we make and the values that we uh, that affect how we spend our money, how we raise children, how we um, uh, interact with neighbors. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's where I would go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not enough to win the podcast, I realize, but that's my that's my humble idea. I think Caroline did that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love playing with the, the faith of and faith in. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that that's a rich reflection. Um, and, and, and part of that is uh, I look at the what – who is it in whom Jesus had faith? So the faith of Jesus becomes who Jesus trusted. Um, you know, what is it that Jesus was confident God was doing as Jesus took on this kingdom building work? So I, I'm, I'm not going to give you the podcast, but that's a close second. <laughs> 